Yeah, I want to talk to you today about uh, my experience using Datomic on a project that I'll describe. Um, along the way, I want to get into some of the details of how I can have come to think about uh, Datomic, because I think um, having that model in mind is super helpful. But the context of a real-world application, um, I think, will set the stage very well. Uh, you heard my name. I just want to mention a couple things. Uh, there's my Twitter handle, my email. Um, I always tell people, anybody that um, is able to sit through me talking for a little while earns the right to email me for the rest of their lives with whatever questions they might have. So uh, if you stick to Datomic or Closure stuff, you'll probably get good answers. But if you do need advice on whether to do an adjustable rate mortgage, I'll give it a shot. Um, I'm also the host of the uh, podcast, formerly the Think Relevance, the podcast, uh, now the Cognicast. Um, so we talk about all sorts of things related to software engineering, and Datomic certainly comes up from time to time. So you can check it out at that URL. Um, the project that I, uh, uh, the real world project that we're going to discuss today is a project that um, I, as a consultant, worked with uh, one of our clients, a company named Roomkey. They are in the, as you might guess, the hotel industry. Um, they provide uh, consumers a search engine whereby they can discover uh, rooms uh, at various hotels based on location criteria and other things. Um, I just want to mention them because it was, it's been really great to work with them. I really appreciate them letting me use this application as background for the talk. Um, there's their URL. We actually had them on the podcast uh, uh, talking about this application. Uh, it was more of uh, kind of the business side, like how they, were, how they came to use Datomic. But I put a uh, quick link up there if you wanted to happen to, to listen to that. So um, let's jump into the problem we were trying to solve. OK, so like I said, room keys in the hotel industry. And um, I'm going to simplify the problem a little bit. The system's a bit bigger, but the essential details remain that uh, we have users, and we're, we're trying to provide to another part of the system um, summary information about the sales funnel. People come to the site, and they're shown a list of hotels. You might type in St. Louis, and you get a whole bunch of hotels. Uh, that is called in a slightly uh, uh, it, way that's irregular relative to the way most people talk about impressions. We call that the impression. So that would be, uh, we just showed the user these 25 hotels. Uh, the user might then click on one of those hotels and get details about that hotel. From there, they might click on the hotel with the intention to book a room. We call that a lead. And then uh, if they go through with the process and book the room, there's a booking. So we're gathering these events in, and we want to store them somewhere. We chose Datomic, obviously. And then later, uh, as part of another part of the system that we use to um, do various things, actually, we want a summary of counts. Well, we, we want a, a count of those events by type per hotel per day. Right, so I want to know that there were 35 impressions for the Times Square Marriott on you know, September 5th. Right? This is the problem. Now, if you, if you do the numbers, you can see them right there. There's a fair amount of data here. This is not um, you know, stretching the bounds of what people are doing with big data. But you've got you know, 30 days, 20 events per second. There's an average of five hotels per event, although the only one that has more than one hotel associated with it is the impression. But the, you, know, you just kind of add it up. You get 250 million hotel events they need to sift through, all right? And we want to be able to, do, to answer questions about those summaries in real time. So there are some, some challenges here, because that's a fairly, uh, again, I wouldn't necessarily characterize this as a big data problem, but it's a problem with a fair amount of data when you want to work with it transactionally, because we do actually want to be able to answer questions about how many events there were of this type on this day for this hotel as part of processing uh, uh, a request that we're using to serve um, user interface to the users of the website, OK? Um, so like I said, we chose to use Datomic. Uh, just a quick show of hands. Who here has at least downloaded Datomic and played with it a little bit? All right, great. So a fair number of people. So I think some of you have seen the docs. I, I do have you know, 40 minutes to cover both an application, a solution using it, and then all of the Datomic concepts. So I'm going to move through this stuff fairly quickly. But it is worth um, putting the Datomic architecture slide up here because uh, there are some differences from uh, other databases that you may have used that are not Datomic. Uh, the main one is that, um, well, I don't know if I'd say the main one, but certainly a difference is that uh, here's your app, right, the code that you write. And there are things that happen here in this process, specifically query, right? All the queries actually run in your process, um, as opposed to sending them off to some database server somewhere. And that's, a, that's achieved, uh, that actually has a number of nice properties. And it's achieved because Datomic takes the approach of splitting apart things that are typically together. Uh, specifically, when you have a traditional database, you have one place where you go, and that's where the data lives, and that's where you send in new information, and that's where you go to ask questions. You actually send your question over there. So notice how in Datomic it's blown up. 
the data lives in some storage service right down here. Okay. The application up here does query locally. Query communicates directly with the storage service. So we don't actually need this other piece called the transactor, which is where uh, updates happen. We send all of our, when we want to add information, the application sends it to the transactor, which is where coordination happens. The data is actually stored in storage. Okay. So it's really kind of blowing apart the traditional database. Um, now, you know, just briefly, you can observe one of the advantages here is that um, scaling read is actually a matter of simply adding more nodes where your application is running. In datomic terminology, um, the, the application is a peer. It's a datomic peer. It's the thing that, um, uh, that, that runs your application code. Okay, so I think if you, it sounds like a lot of people have seen uh, datomic. Uh, this is probably mostly review, but I wanted to throw up here as kind of level set. Okay, so let's dive down a little bit. Um, how does datomic see the world? Uh, datomic sees the world, um, it sees a database as a collection of datums, right? Where each datum is a tuple. And the tuple has, um, to a first order, uh, four, four, uh, uh, four aspects. There's the entity, the attribute, value, and the time. Now, the entity is the thing that we're modeling, right? It's roughly analogous to a row in a, in a you know, square, a rectangular database, right? Or if you're an uh, RDF person, uh, subject, predicate, object, this would be the subject. It's the thing we're talking about. In our system, it's going to be what? It's going to be things like hotels. We're going to say, a hotel is an entity, or an event is an entity. Okay, it's the thing that we're talking about, the thing that we're modeling. And those, uh, each of those entities can have um, uh, you know, one or more datums that talk about them, and we use attributes to describe some, some aspect of that entity. Right? Hotel might have a location. Right? So there's an attribute that describes locations of things. Um, and then there's a value that says the actual quantity or quality. The location would be times square. Um, and now here's, and so that's all, you know, fairly straightforward. The one thing that uh, Datomic adds that you don't see too many other places is the notion of time, right? So each of those tuples has a time, or really a transaction, which is effectively when we learn that fact, right? It correlates to a wall clock time. It's not actually serialized that way. But if you have these, these tuples, you know, you, you have facts that include all these things. What are we talking about? What's, you know, what, are, what aspect are we describing? What's the actual quality or quantity? And when did we learn it? Okay, so I've got an example here. Yesterday, as part of a transaction that happened at, you know, 3.02 p.m., I learned that Craig likes pizza. What's the entity? Craig. What's the attribute? Things that he likes. And what's the value? Pizza. And then there's a time or a transaction. Right? We really record time at the transaction level. Now, notice um, what this gives us is a database where you only ever add facts, right? We put a fact in and we say, here's when we learned it. In Datomic, we never really go back and say, uh, it doesn't, I mean, you, you, it's hard to even say in English, right? Like, today I un... this thing that I learned, I, it turns out I no longer learned that. You can add facts that modify things you've already learned. Today, at 3.10, I learned that Craig no longer likes pizza. But you would do that by adding datums to the database, right? So we can really see the database as this um, huge list of these tuples. Well, maybe not huge. This is a list of these tuples that describe, um, you know, things that we know something about and that we learned at some time. Okay? Does that make sense? All right. Again, we're moving through this fairly quickly because I want to make sure we talk about the problem. But we do want to discuss attributes because these are pretty interesting. An attribute, uh, we talked about, you know, uh, Craig likes pizza. So this is sort of the likes part. Um, they have a type, right? Uh, an ident, which is essentially a name, um, and a cardinality. So cardinality would be, you know, um, is, can there only be one datum uh, about likes, or can Craig like many things? Um, now, the types include the stuff you'd expect. Strings, numbers, dates, whatever. Um, there's also, however, significantly, uh, an, at an attribute can have a type of ref. Okay? And when an attribute has a type of ref, its value is the ID of another entity. It's really it's a number. The value is physically a number. But it's meant to be interpreted as that thing over there. There was an event. Someone booked a room at that hotel. We're going to have an entity in the database. We're going to have a datum that talks about the event. The value is going to be, right, the, the, the attribute would be, you know, the hotel this event is associated with. And the value would be a ref to another hotel. So what does this mean? This means that you can see this list of, of tuples as forming a graph, right? 
So it's very powerful, right? You can model all sorts of relationships this way. Um, yeah, and, and uh, the last line is significant. Schema in Datomic is simply the list of attributes. And we, we don't actually have a notion in Datomic of, um, of entity type. So I may, I may describe, actually, let me go ahead and just move on to the, uh, the, the schema that we used in our application, right? So here's an, an example of the attributes, some of the attributes that we used. Um, we have an attribute, for example, called uh, roomkey.hotel slash ID. And this is a convention that um, is not enforced, but that we typically follow where uh, we name attributes via keywords that are namespaced. The namespace is the part that appears before the slash. And it is uh, typical to give that, to make that namespace be um, congruent with the, ty the type of entity that we're describing. Now, entities don't have a type at the datomic level, but we often notionally have. And we're going to have entities in the database that, that are modeling hotels. We're going to have other entities that are going to be modeling you know, events, things that happened at, uh, about those hotels. And so you can see we would define some of our attributes with a, a namespace, the bit that appears before the slash, it's roomkey.hotel, and some that are uh, roomkey.event, uh, meaning that we intend for those attributes to be uh, part of datums whose entity is modeling a hotel in the case of the first attribute or an event in the case of the other three. Does that kind of make sense? But it's just convention. There's nothing in Datomic that actually prevents you from saying, this entity, which notionally, you know, conceptually models an event, has an attribute of, uh, you know, roomkey.hotel slash ID. You could do that. It wouldn't mean anything, but Datomic's view is, you know, if you're going to, we'll let you say anything you want to, even if it doesn't necessarily make sense in the context of, your, context of your application. And that flexibility actually turns out to be a real asset. Okay. So let's look at these real quick. Um, so a hotel has an ID. It's a string. I uh, mentioned briefly in the last slide that... Uh, you can provide some, uh, some additional characterizations of attributes. One of them is uniqueness, right? So what, what does that mean? That means that only one entity in the database can have hotel ID with a particular value, right? Times Square Marriott, right? Or whatever we're using for IDs. Okay, that's a constraint that Datomic will enforce. Um, what else are we going to model? We're going to model events. Events are going to have a type. The type is a ref. I'll talk about why that is in a minute. Uh, cardinality single, right? There, it can only uh, reference one type. Events can't say, you can't have two datums in the database where you say, this, this event, you know, that is modeled by entity 5678 has, there's a datum that says that entity attribute type value something, and then another datum that says same entity, same attribute, different value. That's what cardinality single means. You can't have two datums with the same entity and attribute but with different values at the same time. All right, uh, hotels we ha uh, is, a, is also a ref, meaning we're going to have datums in the database where the entity identifies some event, the attribute is what hotels are about that event, and the value is a list of some other entities, right? Remember, because you could have an impression where we showed a user like 25 events, so we would say, oh, well, there's a datum in the database for each of the hotels that this event is associated with. And then, of course, there's a time. Uh, when the event occurred. And we'll get back uh, to that when we come around to how we actually solve the problem. Does this all make sense? All right, so here's a picture of that. I've kind of put the entity types. Again, they're notional, not, not realized in the database. On the left here, we have, um, actually, let's come back to that in a second. So we have events here in the middle. Um, events, uh, there's an, each of these kind of uh, rectangles with a blue top and a green bottom represents an entity. And then we have attribute value pairs. So each of these kind of rows here represents a datum, right? Because the datums are actually tuples, E, A, V, T. So for this entity ID, we would have a tuple that would have an attribute, this type, and I've abbreviated these, right? Remember, we usually use namespaces, but to fit it on the slide, this is actually room key dot event slash type. Um, the type is one, two, three. Let's come back to that in a second. The time is, you know, some time. And then notice that we've got a hotel. Remember, those are refs. So what is this value? It's actually the ID of another entity. So a, so what we actually got here is what? A graph, right? That 8765 points to another entity which itself has a datum whose attribute is ID and whose value is, you know, whatever ID we're using, hotel one or something. Okay? Now notice the other thing we've done here is this is um, also somewhat idiomatic in Datomic is um, to model types, um, we've actually, if you recall here, we said that type is a ref, okay? Okay? 
what we did is we said that there are these singleton, essentially, datums in the database. That is, we cause a, we put a datum in the database that represents the event type, okay? So here we've got, and then we give it a, an attribute, which is one of the built-in um, attributes, dbident, that just kind of gives us a way to talk about it in human-readable language, right? So this is the impression, this is the, the one datum in the database that represents impression events, or the impression event type, that one for details, one for lead, one for booking. And then when we want to say an event is of a type, we just add a datum whose entity is the event we're talking about, whose attribute is type, and whose value is the entity ID of the datum that represents that type. Now, why would I want to do that? And we'll come back to this, but the reason is that all of these ref relationships, this graph, they're all traversable in either direction. So we can go from this event to the entity that represents that event type, or the other way, which gives us a nice convenient way to say, tell me all of the events that are of type impression, because we can follow those arrows in both directions. Does that make sense? And we're going to come back to how that's implemented and how you can think about that as the talk progresses we talk about indexes. So again, this is a somewhat simplified version of the problem we were solving, but actually all the fundamentals, uh, all the salient points are here. This really is essentially the problem we were solving, was to, to capture a whole bunch of events, and then the question was, how can you walk back up to this uh, later uh, and ask questions about, you know, oh, Hotel 8765, how many impressions were there, and to navigate through this graph and get a summary of that data. Right? Good? Cool. All right, so um, to, in order to talk about how, how we achieve that, I want to talk some more about um, how this stuff is actually implemented in uh, Datomic. And I'll, I'll admit to doing, um, that's not really bait and switch, but um, I, I, I may have lured you in a bit with the title, Real World Datomic. We really are discussing a real problem that we solved. But the thing I actually want you to walk away from here is an understanding of, of how Datomic stores and retrieves data. Because I suspect that you are not writing a hotel system that is capturing events and want to do queries over them. Whatever you do, however, you, you will benefit greatly from understanding how Datomic organizes its information because it makes almost everything about Datomic kind of fall into place and make sense. Um, uh, so I, I, I want to I wanna spend a little bit of time in the middle here. And it'll actually enable us to talk about a really neat feature of Datomic that we did wind up using to solve our problem. And, by talking about indexes, I think we're going to arm you with uh, both to understand that and then to go forth and use that for your own problems. All right, so we have these, um, these datums. And the way they get into the database is that uh, the application says, OK, there's an event. Um, and it's got this attribute type. And its value is you know, whatever corresponds to impression. And you know, it's got a time. And it's got these hotels. And so you, you make up these entity attribute value tuples. And, you, and notice there's no T. We'll get to that in a second. And you package them up, and you send them off to the transactor. And that's your transaction. Your transaction is a set of those EAV tuples. And the transactor, which again is that, that piece that was down here in the architecture diagram, takes them, and it says, oh, OK, those all belong together. They're all a single transaction. Let me make sure, you know, let me add a T to that. Because remember, all the datums that are actually in the database, we write down when we learned them. We write down when the transactor found out about them. We, so we generate a T, attach it to all those. Now we've got our datums, our EAV T put them in the log, right, durably store it, because it's a database, right, you've got to do that, right, you put it in the log. You know, that's atomic, so that either succeeds or it all fails, it's a good thing. Um, and so then that's, that's in the log, right, at that point, you know, you've got it down on, on, uh, on some, some storage somewhere. Um, and actually, I mentioned this, but Datomic supports multiple different storages. You can actually have your data physically live in a, in a variety of different storages. We were using... Uh, Amazon's DynamoDB, because the room key application is hosted in the Amazon cloud. It's a very convenient, uh, very scalable solution. Um, but uh, it d doesn't really matter for the rest of our discussion. Um, so it's put in the log. And you can actually think of the log as the database, right? Because it's got all the facts in it. Here's everything we learned. Uh, it's in time order, which is probably not the most convenient. For our problem, it's actually not bad. But you can imagine that it's not going to be the best structure to to, to do query for every application. You don't really want to have to go through and say, let's see, the way I figure out uh, how many events there were for this hotel is to start at the beginning of time and look through everything that this database has ever learned. Every time I want to answer a question, 
and uh, just kind of you know, accumulate an answer, right? Probably not the best approach. So what Datomic does is, in addition to storing the data in the log, uh, all datums are also stored redundantly. The whole datum is also stored in um, indexes. OK, now, what's an index? Um, I got to say, the second bullet here uh, are, is like the six words that uh, Rich Hickey, uh, the creator of Datomic, uh, said to me about 10 months ago that made Datomic make sense. An index is a sorted set of datums. OK, seven words, whatever, right? An index is a sorted set of datums, right? Some small number of words. That actually is, I believe, the key to understanding Datomic. So, and that's really it. Like, we have these datums, and datums are just an entity attribute value time, OK? And we're going to take them and put them in a set, right, in the mathematical sense, right? And they're going to be in some order. Um, and the order that they're in um, is, varies by the index. There's actually several indexes. You can see the list of four of them the right there. EAVT, AAVT, AVET, and VAET. Wow, I said that right. Um, and uh, there's one more called the full text index. And with the, the, me saying that there exists a full text index represents the entire extent to which I understand anything about that one. So you can corner Rich later or, or come to me and we'll find somebody that can explain that better. But the, these four indexes, EAVT, AAVT, AVET, and VAET, um, uh, store. Uh, either all or some of the datums, and we'll get into exactly which ones store which, um, in the order name. So the EAVT index, unsurprisingly, stores things first by entity ID, then by attribute, then by value, then by time. And because they're sorted, we can get to any point that we want into them efficiently. Right? Makes sense? OK. So the EAVT and the AEVT index um, get every datum. So every datum that you send to the database, everything goes in the log, of course. All the datums also go into the EAVT and AEVT index. This means that, from a storage perspective, you're storing everything at least three times. But you know, <laughs> when you know, companies can afford to just like, throw an 8 gigabyte you know, flash drive at you, we've moved beyond the point where storage is you know, usually the limiting cost in a system. So um, there's a lot of benefit to be had by doing this. And, um, uh, the, the, if you think about those two indexes, you think about the sort order, it makes perfect sense why you would want those two things. The EAVT index sorts first by entity ID, then by attribute, then by value, then by time. If you think about that, what that means is that it's very efficient to walk up to the index and go, up oh, entity whatever, and then, OK, everything about, the, all the datums about that entity are together. So you can find out all the information about a particular entity efficiently, right? What does that remind you of in a, maybe a traditional database? It's kind of like a row, right? You have a row. It's a bunch of facts about a particular thing. EAVT. It's a bunch of datums, a bunch of facts about a particular thing, about a particular entity, right? And conversely, or I don't know, maybe it's not conversely. I forget the definition of converse. But also, we have AEVT, right, which stores first by attribute. So you can walk up and say, oh, uh, you know, uh, let's say I've got, you know, entities in this database that represent people. Let me go find the part of the AEVT index that talks about first names, attribute first name. Oh, here are all the first names in the database, if you like, or some subset thereof. OK? What's that like? If EAVT is like a row-oriented view, what's AEVT like? Column-oriented view, right? And we always have both of these. So you can pick which one is more efficient for your needs, OK? Um, so uh, this is just like a, you know, to visualize a little bit better, you can see we've got our datums. Each one of these rows is effectively a datum, EAVT. And you can see in the EAVT index, we sort first by E, right? So all the, all the datums about the event one entity come together. And then all the datums about the event two entity come together. And then we sort by A and then by V and then by T, right? So there's hotel. Now, in point of fact, Datomic is not storing them as, you know, angle bracket E, V, E, N, T, right? These things are all stored in a, in a different form, where the, 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 the E that we're storing is actually the ID of an entity. And we'll get more in a minute, in a little while, um, to exactly uh, what the advantages of that are. So this is really a more uh, realistic view of what's actually in the database. But I think, uh, conceptually, you know, this is a reasonable way to, to to think about it, and um, we'll, we'll, uh, we're going to use this representation going forward.
And so then very similarly, here's the AEVT index, right? Notice that here um, everything is together by attributes. So all the hotels are together, all the times are together, all the types are together. Um, and then we sort by E, right? All right, so what about the other two? The other two you don't always get. Uh, the AVET index, which is the only one that's actually pronounceable, AVET, um, only stores datums where we have defined the attribute uh, to be marked with DB index true. So we've said we want this attribute to be all datums that are the, the, where the A is this attribute to be in the AVET index, which makes sense. AVET. First name Craig, right? AV, my first, we're store by A, first name V is Craig. Those will all be together. So now I have an easy way, if I know the A and the V, to go and look up all the entities that have that. That's kind of what you'd expect index true to mean, right? And then there's VAET, which is also called the reverse index. And you only get this one for attributes that you defined whose type is ref, okay? And this is what allows us to traverse relationships in reverse. Remember I said you can always go from an event to the hotels that it talks about, or from the hotel back to the events that are connected to it. And that's because in a ref datum, the E is maybe the event, the A is the ref attribute, and the V is what? The hotel entity. If you switch those E and the V, reverse index, it's just the same information pointing in the other way. So the same datum, just organized differently, gives us that reverse relationship. Make sense? OK, cool. Um, and then this is, you know, nothing special here. Just notice that, unlike the previous slide, not all of the datums are here. Only the datums for the attribute marked index true wind up in the AVET index. And similarly, only the attributes of type ref wind up in the reverse index. All right. So now it's not the case that we store the datums in the index and then pull them back one at a time. If you remember from the architecture slide, your application's running up here, storage is down here, right? And there's a cache, but you know, maybe your database isn't big enough to fit in the cache. So you occasionally have to go across the network. It would be silly if you had to go and pull one datum back at a time. So datums are actually stored in these chunks, compressed, called segments. And the segments are organized as a tree, which is how you get efficient navigation. It's a tree with a high branching factor. Right, so you can imagine that you know, there's this root node, and you say, OK, I'm looking for E. I'm looking in the EAVT index. I'm looking for the E of 1, 2, 3. Oh, OK, looks like 0 to 100 is down this branch. OK, I get to the second node, and then, you know, uh, or whatever. Right? You can navigate down efficiently to the, to the place in the index you're, uh, you're looking for. OK? Now, the segments are immutable. Once an index segment is put into the index, it never changes, right? which is awesome for caching. Right? There's nothing like immutability for caching. Um, it also means that nobody can ever change the database out from underneath you. Right? You've got a root. You know that everything the root points to is never going to change. So you can just hang on to it, and you can do stable query for as long as you want. It also means that every transaction conceptually creates a new root by creating new segments as needed. So anytime we need to put a new datum in the middle of an existing segment, we maybe have to bust that segment into two create two, or, you know, the old one stays there, but you create two new segments, but you can share segments that haven't changed, okay? And in a point of fact, that's not actually done on every transaction, right? Datomic is more clever about its implementation, um, but you can notionally think of it that way. So indexes are arranged in trees. Um, when you want to add data, the best case is that you just say, okay, there's a new root in pink here, and, well, it's pretty much the same as the old thing, except there's new stuff at the end, so I just need to create uh, one new root segment, one, maybe one new intermediate segment, one new leaf segment, and then point to all the old existing ones. And notice that people can continue to use the old one, no problem. Nothing has changed. And people that want an updated view of the database can come along and, and use this root. Um, one thing to be careful, of course, is that, um, uh, you know, I'm not going to talk about that right now. We'll come back to that at the end. So let's come back to our problem now that we understand how Datomic stores indexes. And I, it really is that straightforward. An index is a sorted set of datums. Here are the sort orders. You know which datums wind up in each one. Um, we went ahead and tried to write a query. This is data log. I don't have time to go into data log. But it's the query language that Datomic offers. A couple interesting points here. Uh, first of all, this is a four-way join. Fits on one slide. That's pretty awesome, right? Um, and it's relatively painless. Um, again, I want to go into the syntax. The other thing I want to point out here is that um, 
We have arbitrary closure code running in here. Here's a little bit of code, closure code. And I should point out that um, Datomic is usable for many JVM language. I happen to use closure, but that's not uh, a limitation or a requirement. Uh, but what I have here is, is code that is running um, arbitrary closure code as part of the query, right? Pretty neat. Um, and uh, you can kind of see what's going on here now, right? Because what do we say? I mean, again, without going too deep into data log, what have we got here? We've said, OK, well, I'm looking for some datum uh, that has an, uh, the things that start with a question mark are stuff that we don't necessarily know to begin with. That has some E. The attribute is room key hotel ID, and the, and the V is hotel ID, which is actually passed in. So which index would this clause use? Well, we know A and we know V. So what would be the ideal index to use? AVET, right? Because it's efficient. To, if you know the A and the V, you can go right to the part you need. So what do we know about this attribute? It better be marked index true, right? Or else there is no AVET index for those datums. And then we have to traverse one of the other indexes to find the datums that we care about. OK. The other thing I would like to point out about this is that it didn't work. OK. Uh, the, that query, if you ran it over all 250 million datums that we cared about in order to get an answer, took way too long. Um, and way too long here was defined by our requirement to have an answer back in 100 milliseconds, right? which is obviously extremely aggressive for that amount of data. And the problem is that there's no query order that we could pick that eliminates enough data. One of the other things that falls out of understanding uh, how Datomic stores the uh, information, you can, you can kind of see how um, since uh, there is currently no optimizer for datomic uh, queries, having data in the right order really helps you. Because if you can start out with a clause, each of these uh, lines after the where is a clause, if you can start out with a clause that narrows the data way, 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 way down, um, then you, depending on your query, you can really win later on by having fewer things you need to determine in order to get a, uh, to get a, uh, a good, res uh, a quick result. Um, that's totally going to depend on your data. For us, there was no query order. Like, we, we did make that mistake, but w even after we optimized it, um, th there was still no query order that was going to get us the answer to, for this arbitrary set of hotels, tell me a count of everything by event type in the last 30 days. It just, it just wasn't going to work. Um, so uh, a after doing a little more thinking and getting some help from Rich, um, we, uh, we were able to take another approach that did work. Um, and along the way, uh, we wound up using a feature of Datomic that's pretty cool that I want to mention, uh, especially because it was part of our solution. Now, in order to talk about that, I need to talk a little bit about entity IDs. Remember, we talked about the fact that entities, you know, the E in that tuple is actually a number. Um, and that number has two parts, high bits and low bits. The high bits are something called uh, the partition, uh, which is a user assigned, um, you don't actually assign a number. You can, cr you can allocate partitions in Datomic, which I should point out is not about reserving disk space or doing anything with storage. It's just about saying, logically, right, there is this thing called a partition, which is really just associated with a number. We don't get to know what the number is, but it, it's going to be the high bits of entity IDs that we're creating. Okay? And then the low bits are a time-like component, so it's effectively a number that goes up over time. So why would we want to do this? Well, think about it. The, the indexes are sorted you know, in some order. Take the EAVT index, sorted first by E. If you can say all event entities have an E whose high bits are the same as all other event entities and whose high bits are different than hotel entities, what have you done in the index? You've grouped all the datums by entity type or by whatever criteria you want, right? You're saying, I, I get to say, you know, not what the high bits are, but which entities have the same high bits, right? So you can, that's, that's a, it's a, pa a partition in, in the sense of being a subset of all the datums in the index. And you can have quite a large number of partitions. Uh, in our system, we partition by our notion of entity type. So there's a partition for hotels, a partition for events. I'm actually building a new version of the system wherein we actually partition by event type. OK? But you can do it however, whatever makes sense to you. And again, it's really about grouping datums in the index so that when you traverse over the index, whether it's via query or this other mechanism that I'm going to mention, that I'm going to mention um, you get efficient traversal.
Make sense? Okay. All right, so what, now that we understand that, what did we actually wind up doing? Well, <laughs> a, a big win for us was to realize that in a database where you only ever add things and where the data is immutable, I mean, particularly for event data, where we're only ever creating new entities for, for events, because an event happens, we record information about it, and we never have to go back and say additional things about that entity. Um, we can cache. We can cache like crazily, right? If we have the answer for yesterday, there's nothing that's going to happen today that's going to change any of the counts of the events about yesterday or the day before, et cetera, and so forth. We still have to populate that cache. Um, and for our particular data set, uh, we could not achieve our uh, performance requirements um, uh, via query. So we actually um, uh, used an API that uh, Datomic provides called Seek Datums. OK, what does Seek Datums do? Seek Datums gives you an iterator over one of the indexes, over actually any of the indexes. You say which index you want to iterate over. You get back a uh, Java Lang iterable, which is fast. It's lazy, and it's reducible in the, in the sense of closure core reducers, if you're familiar with that, um, which is another way of saying fast. Um, so this is really great, because we can walk up to the index, and we can say, boop, start here, and zzz, just go forward, and build our summaries, put them in the cache, and then use the cache to answer questions. And we were actually able to do that um, uh, quickly enough that in our application, we simply do that when the application comes up, and then again, every time we feel like updating it. We don't actually even need to bother uh, persisting, like in the sense of putting it on disk or in memcached or something somewhere, um, uh, the, the cache data. It's, it's cheap enough for our purposes to, to simply build that when the process comes up. Okay? The only other piece we needed to do that was we needed another API called entid at. You give it a time and a partition, and it gives you an entity ID. And why would you want that? Because you need to know where you're going to start uh, in, the, in the index. We're using the EAVT index, so given a partition, which is essentially the high bits of the entity ID, and a time, and remember the low bits are a time-like component, it will fabricate a, a, an E value that we can say, yep, that's something that corresponds to, uh, that is either equivalent to or before the very first event entity for such and such a date, which is what allows us to, you know, zip over the cache starting from an arbitrary date. So we can, we can chop up our, um, our, uh, our index by date, which is really handy. Okay? Um, here's a little fragment of actual code from the... Uh, from the application. Um, it's a function uh, that takes a database, and this is typical in um, datomic applications that you pass around the database. The database is the index root, not, uh, notionally, right? Because that's, that's how you get to all the segments for that particular value of the database. Uh, you give it some partition, you give it a start date and an end date. We fabricate entity IDs that correspond to that start date and that end date. Then we call seek datums. We tell it which database we're enumerating over, we tell it which index, and then we give it an E. We could optionally give it an A, a V, and even a T. It starts enumerating at that point in the index, and we do whatever we want. Here, I just uh, throw in a little code that says, well, we're just going to take, we're just going to take datums until the E goes past um, uh, the, the entity ID that corresponds to the last event for that day, right? And then we have other code that takes the, you know, this that comes back and reduces it into the summary that we want, and then we store it off in a big cache. Does this make sense? All right, why shouldn't you just always do this? This sounds super awesome. What do you give up? You give up a lot, actually. You give up uh, joins, for one thing, and you saw how um, joins are relatively pain-free in data log. I wish I had more time to talk to you about data log, but uh, you also give up a bunch of other things. Like, you give up the fact that our, our query, I mean, this is essentially our query now, which is a bunch of closure code. Whereas before, if, I, if we could have pulled it off this way, our query is data. Um, and if you've had any exposure to the closure world, you know that we really, really, really like data because data is really powerful. Data all the things, right? Um, so that's another thing that you give up. Um, the other thing is, you know, you're walking away from the implementation of data log, not only now, but everything that it could become. So. You really have to kind of take this uh, into consideration. The other thing I would say is that you, know, you should absolutely not look at this and go, query is slow, therefore we should use seek datums. Right? Query was uh, problematic for the shape of our data that we were using. Um, but you know, the data is immutable. 
It's cached when you pull it in these segments, which are you know, efficient chunks that we pull back. And machines today have a boatload of memory. A boatload of memory. Even like a really cheesy EC2 medium has like three gigs of memory. There's a pretty good chance that um, maybe not all your database will fit in memory, but a good chunk of it. And guess what? If you're, if you're using the AEVT index, right, those datums are organized by attribute first. And so if, if you have a, 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 a user entity that has first name, last name, social security number, blah, 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 but you only care about first name and last name, you probably only need to cache the segments of the AEVT index that are about first name and last name. And the rest of the database can just hang out in storage, right? And if that's the case, then your query is happening over memory. And so you need to take that into consideration as well when you think about, when you think about performance like this. So um, I think there's, this is a really good technique to know about, but I, I would definitely uh, not advise people to start there. All right. Like I said, we had a lot to talk about, only 40 minutes, but I think we, uh, we covered it pretty good. I should have mentioned RoomKey again. They were super awesome to A, even let me talk about this, and B, to work with. And then a few people on the Datomic team that uh, uh, help with the slides. So uh, I think that uh, takes me uh, over. I don't, I don't have time to answer questions up here, but I'd be happy to catch anybody in the hall or afterwards. So uh, thanks. <laughs>